it all started with a lonely old man at the edge of town named Patrick Haynes. He was practically a hermit and never interacted much with the outside world. He stayed in his dilapidated house on his small plot of land, surrounded by the jungles of weeds and husks of junked cars that littered his property. I had a paper route and would ride my bike every day before school delivering newspapers. I hated having to wake up with the cold and darkness wrapped around the world like a noose. I was having a nightmare about some pretty girls from my high school turning into beautiful demonic succubi who lured guys into a party just to bite their heads off while having sex with them. My alarm clock suddenly went off with a shrill cry. I gave a soft shriek of terror. I jumped up in bed, still covered in sweat and terrified. For a moment, the dream world and the real world seemed to blend into one horrifying tapestry. I blinked quickly, clearing away the cobwebs. Jesus, I have to stop watching so many horror movies before bed. I mumbled to myself as I got up to put on my clothes. I could still hear the crunching, wet snapping sound as succubi had beheaded their male lovers. I remember trying to cry out as they held up the decapitated heads towards me before opening their mouths wide and popping them in. But at least I hadn't woken up screaming this time, like I had every other day this week. My mother was in the nicotine-stained kitchen, smoking cigarette after cigarette and watching 24-hour news channels. Heavy bags hung under her eyes. Mom didn't sleep much lately. Ever since she had tried to quit drinking, she stayed in the house now all day, every day, just staring blankly at the TV like a zombie. Dad had already gone to work. I barely saw him anymore. It seemed like he worked all day, every day. Yet still, I knew he had major financial problems. You going to deliver the papers? Mom asked in a hoarse voice, her blank eyes looking right through me. I nodded as I grabbed a quick bowl of cereal and some milk. Yeah, if I don't leave now, I won't have time, I exclaimed tiredly, trying to avoid looking at my mother. Mom, are you okay? She blinked slowly at this before taking a deep drag on her cigarette. I'm not okay, Bobby. I feel like I'm losing my mind, she whispered, looking so hunched over and tired in her bathrobe. But I think the worst has passed. I'm not hallucinating anymore. Is that AA stuff helping? I asked. She shrugged. They're right about everything, but it doesn't mean they can help me, she responded sadly. I think I'm too far gone sometimes. Even if I win for a day, how can I fight against this monster for the rest of my life? She leaned close to me, an urgent expression coming over her face. Addiction runs in your family, Bobby. Don't ever become like your grandfather and uncle. Don't ever become like me. Drugs and alcohol are just a way of slowly committing suicide, like a coward would. It takes place of your soul every single day until there's nothing left but a scarred husk, an empty shell of misery and weakness. And once you're in, there's no way out. No way out. She repeated it slowly and methodically, like a scared mantra. No way out. I pedaled along the empty streets. The autumn wind howled in fury scattering dead leaves and flying trash in my wake. Our town of Harville only had a few thousand people and absolutely nothing to do except hike, shooting guns, and swimming. The naked trees covered the gently rolling hills like a thick brown rug. The lights of houses dotted the landscape. I threw the papers as fast as I could as I flew by on my bike. I wanted to get this done, to get out of the cold night. As I got further from Main Street, the houses grew sparser, the forests thicker and darker. Patrick Haynes's house was the last one on my route, and then I would be done. Still pedaling like a madman, I glanced over at his shabby little house while I chucked his paper. I saw the door standing wide open. All the lights in the house were shut off. A smeared trail of blood ran up the front steps. I quickly pulled over my bike, hitting the kickstand and setting it up in the jungle of tall grass that swayed in the breeze in his front yard. A cold blade of dread pierced my heart. Mr. Haynes? I called loudly, slowly walking towards the open front door. 
As I got closer, I could see that it had been smashed open. It hung slanted. One of its hinges totally busted off, and the other half pulled out of the wall. Oh shit, I whispered as I looked at the damage. Please. A weak voice called out faintly from the bowels of the dark house. Help me. Help. Mr. Haynes, do you need an ambulance? I tried calling back, but there was no reply. Shuddering, I crept inside. I tried the lights, but the power had gone off. I noticed the heat had stopped as well. I pulled my jacket tight around my body, zipping it up. I really did not want to go in there. Every part of my intuition screamed at me to get out. It was times like this that I cursed my parents for not giving me a cell phone. They said once I turned 16, I could get a better job and buy my own cell phone if I wanted. Logically though, I knew there was no reason I should turn and run. This old man had probably hurt himself and needed help immediately. There was nothing to be scared of, unless, maybe, there was still an intruder still inside the house. What if the voice calling out wasn't Patrick Haynes at all, but some psychopath who murdered him and now lay in wait in the shadows? God damn it, I whispered, vacillating. I started to take a step inside the house, then to go back towards my bike. I figured I could go to another neighbor's house and ask them to call an ambulance and the cops. Then a pained, high-pitched wail shattered the silence. Oh God, that hurts, Patrick Haynes roared. Swearing, I tried to blindly feel my way through the house towards the screaming voice. The moonlight streamed in through the windows, giving some illumination. But now there was another problem. The entire house looked like something from a hoarder's documentary, and it smelled. I noticed odors of rotting food, decaying garbage, and mold. I saw dishes piled up three feet high in the sink, ancient newspapers stacked up to the ceiling in the living room black garbage bags strewn all over the place. As I passed through the kitchen, I caught a glimpse of an overflowing ashtray on the counter. Next to it sat a lighter. I immediately grabbed it, flicking it and holding it out in front of me to drive away the creeping shadows. The place looked even worse than I had imagined with the extra light. Cockroaches skittered away through cracks and under doors. The sinister glint of tiny rat and mouse eyes glittered back at me from every corner of the room and the pained gurgling of Patrick Haynes had now, finally, stopped. I kept making my way back towards where I thought the crying had came from. I found a closed bedroom door. I reached out to turn the handle, but it felt sticky and repulsive under my grasp. I looked at it closer, realizing it was entirely covered in blood. I repressed an urge to gag and quickly pushed the door open before wiping off my hand on my blue jeans. Mr. Haynes! I whispered as the door creaked. This bedroom was even worse than the kitchen and the living room. It looked like a flea market had somehow fused with a dump and then exploded. I saw knickknacks, bags of trash, old water damaged books, and empty prescription bottles all over the place. A small trail was cut into the towers of garbage, almost like a deer trail scouring its way through the thick brush. From the back of the room, I heard groaning and pained, raspy breathing. I made my way through the piles of junk, worried that they might collapse on me at any moment. I turned the last corner, holding the lighter high in front of me as if it were a religious sacrament used to drive back vampires. Against the back wall, I saw Patrick Haynes. He had wrapped himself in a giant brown cocoon. Strands of thin, hair-like tendrils formed an oval shape over the entire corner of the room. They seemed to grow into the walls themselves. I could see cracks like spider webs in the sheetrock where the tendrils penetrated it. Patrick Haynes lay half out of the cocoon. He had ripped through some of the brown filaments and now stood bent over and naked. His legs stayed inside the cocoon while the top half of his body poked out as if he were some giant, ugly infant trying to make its way out of some alien birth canal. What happened to you? I cried. He raised his face, and I quickly backpedaled, slamming hard into a tower of books and newspapers. I recognized some of the features of Patrick Haynes, yet at the same time, this wasn't him at all. This thing seemed inhuman, even alien. 
His mouth jutted out six or seven inches, narrow and fanged like a crocodile's. His eyes were the same pale, watery blue eyes of Patrick Haynes, but his nose had rotted away. In its place stood a blackened crater of necrotic tissue. All the hair on his body appeared to have fallen off. His clothes hung in tatters all around him. His skin had turned into something insectile. It glittered in the dim light of the flame, chitinous and black like the skin of some enormous beetle. Coming off both sides of his body, I saw lots of tapering pointed appendages, each a few feet long and as thin as a pencil. They reminded me of the many sharp legs of a house centipede. It hurts, Patrick Haynes groaned as more flakes of pale white skin fell off his scalp and face. Oh God, what's happening to me? I feel strange, hungry. His crocodilian mouth snapped together with a sound like a pistol shot. The corners of that strange mouth turned up into a grin. Oh, so hungry. He started to pull himself the rest of the way out of the cocoon. It ripped open with a sound like haystalks being trampled. I didn't answer the eldritch creature that had once been Patrick Haynes. As I looked into his blue eyes, seeing all the agony, fear, confusion, and hunger there, something in me snapped. I turned, running out of the house without looking back. What the hell, what the hell, what the hell, I kept whispering, repeating it as I pedaled across the dark streets. The nearest house was only about a two-minute bike ride, but with the adrenaline rush and the terror gripping my heart, I think I made it in there in half that time. The trees flew past at tremendous speeds, but I didn't slow down. All I could think about was that creature ripping its way out of the cocoon, and then what would he do? I saw the white colonial looming up on my left. I gave a sigh of relief as I pedaled across the freshly mown yard. I checked my watch, seeing that the sunrise would start in about 20 minutes. For some reason, that gave me hope. I jumped off the bike, sprinting towards the front door. I started pounding on it with all my strength, smashing it with the side of my fist over and over. Hello? I shouted. We need the police and ambulance here. Your neighbor is hurt or something. Can you please call the cops? I kept shouting and slamming my fist, but no lights in the house turned on. Just as I was about to give up and go to the next house, the front door slowly creaked open, as if it had been done so on its own. I heard heavy, labored breathing from inside. I took the lighter out, flicking it in front of me. I screamed as I saw the mutilated bodies strewn across the hallway. Their throats had been torn out. Their sightless eyes stared blankly up at the ceiling. I quickly realized it was an entire family laying here mutilated in front of me. A mother, a father, and their two daughters. It looked like something had eaten away their stomachs and even ripped out the heart of one of the girls. The ribs in her chest jutted up like claws around the gaping, empty hole. Behind the families, I caught a glimpse of something black and shiny, as if some enormous centipede crouched there in the shadows. It hissed a shrill, high sound that pierced the silence. All I could smell was their blood and my own sweat at that moment. I slammed the door shut, turning and running towards my bike. I had just reached it when the door exploded outwards as if something had fired a cannonball at it. Another one of those insectile, humanoid monstrosities ran out. Its shrill, raspy hissing echoed through the night. I jumped on the bike and pedaled out of there as fast as I could. I didn't dare to glance back. The house was on top of a gently sloping hill, and I had a long descent to Main Street. I have never in my life gone as fast on a bicycle as I did during my escape from that creature. I heard more of its diseased growls and hisses. Its thudding footsteps followed me ceaselessly across the town. A few times, it sounded so close that it might have been able to reach out and brush its fingers across my back. My house appeared up ahead and on the right. I saw my dad's truck in the driveway. He stood outside on the border of the sidewalk with a 12-gauge shotgun. When he saw me, he gave a grim smile. Dad, help, I cried as I pedaled frantically towards him. He saw the monstrous, transformed shape sprinting after me and raised the shotgun. I ducked down on the bike as he fired, trying to make myself as small a target as possible. 
The boom echoed through the night like thunder. A slug whizzed past my body. I heard the creature give a tortured gasp. Its body fell to the concrete with a heavy thud. I stopped my bike, still shaking. My heart felt like it might explode in my chest. I looked back at the creature that had chased me, seeing the same crocodilian snout, the same chitinous shell, the same centipede-like appendages. Dad ran over to me, hugging me. He pulled me off my bike. I saw Mom standing in the front door, pale and trembling. He's alive, Dad shouted. It started, but he's alive, and we're together as a family again. Aren't you supposed to be at work? I asked breathlessly. I mean, thank God you're not, but... When I got there, I found my boss in his office, wrapped up in a giant cocoon, Dad said, giving a strange glance at Mom. Once I saw it, I knew what it meant, and I raced back here. When I realized you weren't here, I thought, we thought you were dead, eaten, Mom cried, tears flowing down her face. But come inside, come inside. It's not safe here anymore, not until it's all over. It's something in the water of Harville, something in the air. Every hundred years this starts happening, Dad said. Mom gave a cry of relief. Oh God, it's finally time, she wailed, her hair sticking up, her face a mask of insanity. We can go to sleep and wake up without this burden of our humanity. No more pain. No more thoughts. Dad nodded, turning to me. Don't you feel it, son? The first creeping fingers of the sleep? The metamorphosis? I can feel it, like ice water in my veins. The tiredness. The sleep of the dead. I opened my mouth to argue, to say no, but my mind felt blank. My body felt cold. I only nodded. Then it's time, Mom said, drawing us together in a hug. It's time to start the change. Thank you for listening to People in My Town Have Wrapped Themselves in Cocoons. Today, they started opening by J.H. Salem. You can find a link to the original story in the description below. Please consider subscribing to the channel and activating notifications. Join our mysterious community to ensure you never miss any of these haunting narratives. If you're already thirsty for more, go ahead and click the video that's on the screen, since YouTube thinks that you should check it out next. Until our next encounter in the dark corners of the unknown, this is Josh Bloodbath, bidding you farewell from the Savage Creep Show. Sleep well, or perhaps don't sleep at all. <laughs>